Merry Christmas and welcome to Life Church. My name is Heather Acton and I'm a part of the Life Kids team here at Life Church. And we are just so glad that you are here with us right now celebrating Christmas Eve with us. On December 26th, we will not be meeting in person. So check us out online for that service. We will be meeting again on January 2nd here in person. The women's Bible study starts again on January 10th. So make sure you check out our website and our group page for more information. After the first of the year, we're going to be starting Life Small Groups, which are groups of people who are pursuing how to live like Jesus, love like Jesus, and share his message with others. So if you're interested in that, make sure you check out um, our website for more information. Our 21 day of fasting and prayer starts on January 10th. This will be three weeks of us focusing our hearts on the Lord. Are you looking for opportunities to plug into community life here at Life Church? If you are, come to our ministry fair on January 23rd. It's gonna be an opportunity after both services for you to meet up with leaders of our groups, Bible studies and ministries, and check out what it's all about. Now, let's celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus as we move into a time of worship.
faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him. Oh, come let us adore 
The Magi, or the wise men as they're sometimes called, are some of the most widely recognized and yet some of the most widely misunderstood and mysterious figures in the entire Christmas story. I mean, who were they? Where did they come from? How many were there? Why did they come? And, and how did they know to go looking for some newborn king of the Jews when the Jewish scholars of the day didn't even know? As we get ready to look at the answers to these and other questions, let's prepare our hearts and minds with a moment of prayer. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for bringing us into your presence today. God, we, uh, we celebrate the birth of your son. And as we celebrate that birth, Lord, we celebrate all that that means for us, the great gift that it is to each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray that we, like the wise men, would search and search and search until we find that gift for ourselves and that we'd be willing to give whatever it means, whatever it takes to make it ours. We pray this in your great name. Amen. Start off, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verses 1 and 2. Matthew records that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, for many of us with curious minds who weren't born in the first century Judea, Matthew's account of the wise one, the Magi, leaves a lot of holes for us, doesn't it? It, it? There's a lot of holes here. I mean, he gives us no practical details about who these guys are, what a Magi is, what country they actually come from. He doesn't even tell us how they knew the meaning of the star that they followed. Instead, they just kind of show up, they leave their gifts, and then they disappear. But because of this lack of detail in Matthew's account, People down through the ages have tried to fill in the blanks, if you would, fill in the gaps by creating traditions and legends that are often are created without checking the facts. For example, how many of us remember the old Christmas classic, We Three Kings of Orient Are? How many of you know that one? Friends, even this great old song is wrong on several accounts. For example, there's no evidence that there were three wise men. None. The only evidence is that the wise men that did come brought three kinds of gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, Matthew 2, 11. As a matter of fact, there are a number of traditions that say there were four wise men, and there's still another one that says there were 12 wise men. Furthermore, Scripture doesn't say that they were kings. In fact, they almost certainly were not. And as for being Oriental, <laughs> Matthew gives us no information about their origin other than they came from the East. Bottom line through the years, there has been a lot of misinformation, if you would, fake news spread about the Magi through traditions and legends and even Christmas cards and movies. And so today, through biblical and historical resources, I want us to discover the truth about these mysterious visitors. Why? So that you and I can literally join them on their journey to find Jesus, to find Jesus, the pearl of great price. First, who were they? Who were these magi? Well, the ancient Greek historian Herodias records that the magi were a priestly caste of the Medes. In other words, they were Zoroastrian priests from Persia, which, which is now modern Iraq and Iran. And so if Herodias is correct, and the truth is most historians and most scholars today believe that he was, then our biblical magi were both men of science and men of superstition. As men of science, they were men skilled in philosophy and medicine, mathematics, and the natural sciences, and in all the legal matters of the day. As a matter of fact, our word magistrate comes from their name magi. They were men of the law, men of science but they were also men of superstition. The Magi were also soothsayers and wizards and interpreters of dreams as well as astrologers. In short, they practiced the occult. As a matter of fact, our word magic comes from their name, Magi. And so the Magi were men of science. They were men of superstition. And with their vast knowledge, 
they not only served as advisors for present kings, but catch this, they were also king makers. That was a part of what they did. In other words, they helped select and train future kings. Which, of course, explains why in Matthew 2, 3, it says that King Herod, the puppet king of Rome over Israel in that day, was disturbed. He was disturbed when they came to his court. King Herod was disturbed when those wise men came, when those magi came. And that word disturbed here literally means he was shaken. He was agitated like a heavy-duty cycle of a washing machine. He was disturbed. Why? Think about it. Because these Persian kingmakers had come to make a king, and it wasn't him. It wasn't him. Of course he was disturbed. Now, let me also give you the rest of the story here, because there's even more. A number of years before that, Herod had been appointed the governor of Galilee by the Romans, all right? He wasn't, he, he wasn't king. He was governor. And shortly after this appointment, the Parthenians, another name for the Persians, went to war with the Romans. And a good portion of the Jewish population joined in with that, with those Persians, and they helped the Persians literally overthrow Herod's rule. They actually stole his throne away from him, and he fled to Rome. When he got there, he pleaded for help, and he got it. And so three years later, with the help of the Romans, Herod became king over all Judea. But of course, you know Herod, he didn't forget what happened, and he certainly didn't forget who did it to him. Never did he forget. And so when these magis, these Persian kingmakers, show up in his court, and they ask, where is this one who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod heard that, of course Herod was disturbed, greatly disturbed disturbed. Friends, the Magi were learned men of science and superstition. They were advisors to kings, and they were king makers. Now, now that we have a handle on who the wise men were, the question becomes, why? Why were the wise men anticipating the birth of Jesus? I mean, friends, when you read the scripture, Herod certainly was not anticipating the coming of a prophesied king, was he? And so why were the wise men anticipating this? Well, to answer that question, we need to go back almost 600 years. Almost 600 years before the birth of Jesus. In 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty Babylonian empire had swept down into Israel, destroying Jerusalem and taking the nation captive. He then handpicked the best of the best, the cream de la cream of all the young men and all the young women so that he could take those best of the best back to Babylon to serve him. Along with those that Nebuchadnezzar selected was a young man by the name of Daniel. Daniel of Daniel and the lion's den. Ironically, Daniel, early in his time in Babylon, had made this huge impact upon King Nebuchadnezzar. How? Actually, by doing one of the things that the Magi, the Magi were supposed to be the very best at, and that was interpreting dreams. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, a dream that deeply troubled his spirit, but somehow he forgot it. He couldn't remember it. And catch this, he called in all his great Magi together so they, so they, so they could remember it for him. But guess what? They couldn't. Can you imagine that? They couldn't remember his dream that he couldn't remember. <laughs> But instead of being mad at himself, he got ticked off at all of them. And so he ordered his magi, all these soothsayers, all the wise men, even Daniel, he ordered all of them to be killed. Well, as you can imagine, when Daniel heard this, he dropped to his knees and he began to pray. And as he prayed, God revealed to him not only the forgotten dream, but the interpretation of it. Later, when Daniel shared the dream and the interpretation with the king, it saved both his life and the lives of all the other magi. That's in Daniel chapter two. And as a result, hear this, as a result of this extraordinary event, Nebuchadnezzar elevates Daniel to become, if you would, the master of the magi, which of course meant that he was now the primary influencer of the magi. Don't miss this. He's the primary influencer of the magi. And knowing what we know about Daniel's character and knowing what we know about his zeal for God, you and I can be certain of this. He took advantage of the opportunity to instruct the Magi about the one true God. And therefore, it stands the reason that through Daniel's influence, 
these magi would have gained a great deal of knowledge about the Jewish scriptures, especially about the prophecies concerning the Messiah, the coming king, the coming king, and especially the prophecy that's found in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, that says, a star shall come forth from Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. You see, friends, the Magi of Daniel's day would especially been drawn to this prophecy for three reasons. First, they were stargazers. And this prophecy says a star shall come forth out of Jacob. Second, they were kingmakers. And this prophecy says that a scepter, the symbol of a king, will rise up out of Israel. And thirdly, these Magi would have been greatly interested in this prophecy because many hundreds of years before, hear this, that prophecy was actually given by one of their own magi. Don't miss it. That prophecy was actually given by one of their own magi, a man by the name of Balaam. Now, to make a long story short, Balaam, a magi wizard, had been brought in in kind of like a hired gun position with Balak, who was the king of the Moab nation. Why did Balak bring him in? Because he wanted to curse the children of Israel. Why? Because he was afraid of them. Why? Because he didn't think that he could actually beat them in battle. And so he wanted to do what? Defeat them by having them cursed. And so three times in three different locations, Balaam tries to curse the Israelites, but he can't. He can't do it because God won't let him. Instead, each time he tries to curse Israel, God flows this beautiful blessing out of his mouth. Finally, after it's absolutely clear that God isn't going to allow any curse to come out of Balaam's mouth, Balaam then turns to Balak, the king who's hired him, and he says to Balak, Balak, since I can't speak anything but what the Lord tells me, and since he won't let me curse the people of Israel, I'm going to go back home. But before I do, let me tell you the future of what God's going to do through his people. And then Balaam spoke this prophecy. He said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near, not near. Friends, this prophecy was spoken a thousand years before the birth of Christ. I behold him, but not near. And then hear this, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter out of Israel. Friends, I'm convinced that that prophecy uttered by Balaam, a wise man from the east, caused the Magi over a thousand years later to follow that star in search of Christ. Now, what was the star that they followed? Well, of course, all of us know every, every Christmas, planetariums and astronomers offer explanations of the Christmas star, right? Some say it must have been Jupiter or a comet or a conjunction of two or three different planets or a supernova or some other kind of natural phenomenon. But friends, none of those exp explanations are plausible. They're not plausible. Why? Because stars don't move and then suddenly stop. But this one does. The scripture says it goes before them until it rested over the house where Jesus was and it stopped. It stopped. Friends, there is no natural phenomenon, no natural occurrence that could have done that. You say, well, then, Derek, what was the star? The truth is no one knows. The scripture doesn't say. But hear me, the biblical phenomena that most closely resembles it, think about this, the biblical phenomena that most closely resembles a star that could lead them to a precise location and then stop there is the Shekinah glory of God, the visible expression of God's glory. Friends, this is the Shekinah glory of God was in Moses' time, if you remember. And remember the kind of glory of God, it did what? It appeared as a pillar of cloud by day and what? A pillar of fire by night. And what did it do? It went before the children of Israel, leading them from place to place where it would stop and then lead them again, stop and lead them again through the wilderness to the promised land, Exodus 13, 21. The Shekinah glory of God also was what shone on the shepherds when they had learned about Christ's birth, right? In Luke 2, 9. And so perhaps, perhaps when these wise men saw some similar manifestation, they saw of God's glory, they saw it in a way that appeared to be a star. A star. Now catch this, wouldn't that be just like God? To use a star, something that stargazers are very familiar with, to draw them to his son. 
Wouldn't that just be like God? Regardless, whatever the star was, it signified to them that Jesus Christ had been born. After they left Herod, Matthew 2, 9 says, it, the star, reappeared. And it went before them until it came and stood over where the child was. Now, when the Magi found the Christ child, the baby Jesus, where did they find him? Where did they find him? Well, if you and I get our answers from Christmas cards and nativity scenes and paintings and movies, then we probably think that they found Jesus in a stable, right? But the truth is, no. Matthew 2.11 says that the Magi actually found Jesus in a house. In a house. Now, how did the Magi get to this house where the baby Jesus was? Well, in that day, you couldn't just hop into a plane or or hop into a car. And so when these wise men set out to follow the star, they either did it on foot, by horse, by donkey, or by camel. We don't know. But hear this. Because of their significant political power and position as Magi, They probably made this journey on Arabian horses escorted by their own little army, which would have been an absolutely incredible sight, right? Regardless, it took weeks, months, maybe even up to two years for the Magi to finally arrive. How do we know? Because Matthew 2.16 tells us that Herod, after seeking to protect his throne and hating the Christ child, had all the male children in Bethlehem, two years of age and younger, killed. Now, why did he pick the age of two years and younger? Friends, he picked it because it was based on the time, verse 16, that he had learned from the wise men. And so after many months, maybe even up to two years of traveling, what did these wise men do? What did they do when they finally arrived at the house with Mary and Joseph? Well, verse 11 says that they went in And they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and the very first thing they did was they fell on their faces. They fell on their faces and they worshiped. They worshiped him. Don't miss this. Before they did anything else, these kingmakers put their faces in the dirt and they worshiped him. When these kingmakers saw the Christ child with his mother, Mary, Friends, they put their faces in the dirt and they worshiped him. In reverent awe, they submitted themselves to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when they were done, and only when they were done, did they present him with the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And friends, from the very earliest of days, men and women have understood these gifts to be symbolic of the type of man that Jesus was to become. They brought the gift of gold. And gold at that time was the most precious, the most priceless, the most prestigious of all metals. It wasn't owned by the common ordinary people like it is today. It was only owned by the elite, the rich and the royalty. And so the wise men brought the gift of gold, the most precious and most esteemed of all metals for a child that would one day grow to be the most precious and most esteemed of all kings. They also brought the gift of frankincense, incense, the gift for a royal priest. In the background is the picture of the high priest in the temple. And as the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, he would light incense in preparation for prayer. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus came into this world as our great high priest. And in Latin, the word priest actually means bridge builder. And that's exactly what he came to do. He came into our world to build a bridge, to open a way between us and God. The third gift the wise men brought was the gift of myrrh. Now, myrrh is almost an unknown substance today, but in the early years, it was used to embalm the bodies of the dead. Artist Holman Hunt has a famous painting of Jesus that shows Jesus as a young man, and he's standing at the door of his father's carpenter shop in Nazareth. After he's worked all day long, he's stiff and he's tight, and so he goes to the door and he stretches out his arms. And as he stretches out his arms, behind him on the wall, the setting sun casts his shadow in the shape of a cross. And then he looked down and crumpled on the ground beside him is his mother Mary, who's gazing at that shadow, obviously overwhelmed with the thought that one day her son will die on a cross for you and for me. Through the gift of myrrh, we're reminded that God left his heavenly throne 
to come to earth, to suffer and to die for you and for me so that our sins might be forgiven. And so these wise men were used by God to bring the perfect gifts to the Savior. First and foremost, they brought the gift of their worship, of their worship. Because they put their faces in the dirt and in reverent awe, they laid out their hearts wide open for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when they were done worshiping, and only when they were done worshiping, did they give him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold for a true king, frankincense for a royal priest, and myrrh for the one who would suffer and die for our sins. Friends, when these wise men came seeking Jesus, they came to give to give to him all that they had and all that they were. Why? Because they knew. They knew he was the pearl of great price. And because of that, even though they knew it would mean great sacrifice for themselves, these wise men wouldn't let time, they wouldn't let money, they wouldn't let distance, they wouldn't let fatigue, they wouldn't let some evil king to prevent them from finding this pearl of great price. No, they pursued him, and they pursued him, and they pursued him until they found him. Now, let me explain this with Jesus' words. He said, there was a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all he had. All he had, and he bought it. He bought it. Friends, Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price. And when these wise men found him, they gave him all they had and all that they were. How about you? How about you? Friends, wise men and wise women down through the ages have followed the star. They have followed the light that God has given them. And when they have found him, Jesus, the pearl of great price, they have given him all that they had and all that they were. What about you? What about you? What are you going to give Jesus the pearl of great price? Let's pray. God, so often at Christmas, we see it as a time to get presents. Sure, there's that giving piece, but we so often get so excited about the getting piece. But Lord, there would be no Christmas if you first didn't give and then invite us to do the same. Lord, you're not inviting us to do anything that you first didn't do for us. You first loved us and you call us to love you back. You first gave your son, and you call us to give ourselves. And so, God, receive us. Receive us into your arms. Receive us into your family. Receive us into your love and salvation. That, Lord, we might truly reach out for ourselves and possess the girl, the pearl of great price because we have given all that we have and all that we are to obtain it. It's in your great and mighty name that we pray. Amen. As we close, um, many of you are probably wondering, how can I give a Christmas offering? Well, once again, you can give in two ways. You can go to our website and you can give there. And the second way is you can give by check. And the information should be right there on the screen before you. Um, You can send it to Life Church of the Northwest Valley, 8765 West Kelton Lane, Building B3, Suite 140, Peoria, Arizona, 85382. Now as you go, live like Jesus and love like Jesus and share his message everywhere you go. Because when you and I do that, it brings his life. It brings his life to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, and to our world. May God bless you as you bless others.
Jesus, Lord. 